creek, it can be both blessing and curse. At Beaver Creek, there is only one way down, a steep icy road that has humbled many of the sport's fastest men. Now, with the Olympic Games just 14 months away, the world's best have again gathered to test their pace on this perilous hill, including a Viking legend who knows agony here, as well as triumph, and a squad of Americans looking for a renaissance. Each gets a single crack at taming this treacherous course in skiing's marquee event, the men's downhill. From the world-renowned ski resort in Beaver Creek, Colorado, it's the birth of prey, Matt. imagine chilly times at night to preserve the perfect snow conditions and by day warm and sunny for the spectators when you do your job this well you get repeat business so in 2015 Vail Beaver Creek will host the world championships for the third time hi everyone Steve Perino along with Todd Berker who back in his day might have preferred a little more chaos in his downhills but today might be about perfection with that in mind you got to look to the Norwegian Axel Lund Stendhal everyone talking about him he has won here once but historically speaking he has not been a prolific winner in downhill <laughs> yeah but this year everybody's watching him including all the other uh, rivals that he has on the sidelines I mean he is perfect and when you look at his recent history you know, he won the last downhill of the season last year he won the first downhill of the season this year in Lake Louise and as he's always said to me Steve if I'm gonna win a race I want to be fast in training he was the fastest guy down the mountain yesterday he loves this perfect hill well, no doubt the best individual, best team, has to be the Austrians, always is. What they did, interestingly enough, all their veterans sat out one of the three training runs. Some say to rest, others say to hold their cards a little closer to their vest. One thing we do know, that going into the race run, they will not have their head coach, Andy Evers, now working for the Americans. Early sign is that he's having a good impact. Yeah, definitely, he sure is. And, you know, he's made a young up-and-coming uh, skier from the Tahoe area, Travis Ganon. He's made him go a lot faster because he worked on skiing on the flats. A lot of turns on this hill, but the flats on the top, very important. Travis won the second training run. Another U.S. skier to watch, Marco Sullivan, third in the race in Lake Louise last week. He's had injuries in the past, but his confidence is higher, and I think his head is in the right spot to do it again here. So the Americans looking strong, even without Bodie Miller, who is out with injury. The Birds of Prey downhill, though perfect, still one of the most harrowing on the World Cup. Here's a closer look with a GoPro course preview. To me, the Birds of Prey really starts at the break. Timing is critical here, Steve, and these turns really take a total commitment. Correction of the low line is really costly. Some little chatter marks in the hill today are going to make it tough. This is a fast, fast section of the course. Pizzerina, the swing is a little bit more this year. They've extended these turns, made them a little bit longer, more G-forces on the leg. I think the biggest change though is right here in Screech Owl. Long, delayed left-hand turn. The racers aim it right at that blue A netting on the outside. This will be a tough area to keep your maximum speed going. Keep that chest down before the Golden Eagle jump. After the landing, set up for the compression at the bottom. It'll squash you into the back seat at the speed you're traveling down here. Nearly 70 miles an hour. If you've lost time on the top, you've only got a short distance to make it up down here on the bottom. Over the red tail jump and into the finish. The high elevation here makes it a leg burner, Steve. Well, I hope you took your Dramamine for that one. It is one thing to go on board with the GoPro altogether different to take it from the start. We go to Georg Streitberger, and Streitberger will kick out of the gate 1.6 miles long this run, and they'll cover about 100 seconds. Average speed about 60 miles an hour from a dead start across Todd, this very long flat. Well, it's interesting that we refer to this as a flat, but I mean, you're going 60 miles an hour. This is probably the most important section to get your time going. It's only 24 seconds long, but you've got to be right in there if you expect to be in contention. It has a way of just lulling you a little bit, but then, as we saw from the GoPro angle, you hit the brink, and it is game on all the way to the finish line. 23 seconds of gliding. And Steve, it's important to note, I've never seen the snow this fast. Everyone is saying it's a perfect combination of speed and grip. And that's why the guys are nailing a tighter line than what I've really ever seen before on this hill. And that might speak to Strike, a very good Super G skier here. 
in 2010 won the Super G. He's going to use all of those skills. I mean, the timing here to get into the rhythm of this course is important. You've got to nail that first left-hand turn. You can see how much strength he has taken, how many forces he is resisting through this turn. That's the pump house turn, this left-hander. And boy, this is critical to be smooth on your edge down here. One of the fastest parts of the course. And now over the spot, screech out, you said it's changed so much. Well, yeah, look, look at the guys are aiming right at the A net on the outside. That used to be a kind of a glancing turn, and now they're aiming straight to the outside. And Streitberger looks to be clean through there, and now into the Golden Eagle. You know, Streitberger hasn't been spectacular this season. Only 28th in the downhill of Lake Louise, but, you know, what I'm seeing here is he's got a pretty good run going. Fairly clean, good tight line. Holding his speed well down here in the bottom. And off the final jump, getting a little wild ride there off of Red Tail. As Streitberger will cross the line, 142.56, still more than a second off the fastest training time. Well, as we mentioned before, Bodie Miller out with injury, watching from the finish line with his new bride, Morgan. And Miller will be back in action later on this season, perhaps. Here's one of the great characters of the World Cup, Christoph Innerhofer. How about that conversation we had with him yesterday, talking about last year, came into these events concussed, and he said during the run was actually, as he said, blacking out. Well, not quite blacking out, but simply losing his focus. That condition lasted halfway through the year, and he said, in retrospect, maybe I should have pulled out. But when you race, and you are a downhill racer, sometimes you don't do the right thing. Maybe, you think? I mean, blacking out in the middle of the course. I mean, he had two car accidents this summer. One was the uh, Federation's car. One was a loaner Porsche he's out with a little test drive for. I, mean, I always uh, say, nothing drives yeah. like a rental. Exactly. Well, nothing's going to do damage to a back like a little car accident. He's had some back problems over the years. But I, I tell you, when he's on his skis the way he was in 2009, the World Championships, he is just a, a thing to watch. I mean, it's great timing, it's great sense of uh, accuracy in the line. He's followed in the footsteps of teammate Pintafil, an all-rounder, has three medals in three disciplines for the World Championships, and he is well up. Exactly. You see the way he was standing up there. I think the line and the timing were really important to him there. He wasn't trying to get down low, he was just trying to ride a clean ski. He did exactly that. This is a strong run from Innerhofer, who has never been better than 12th on this hill. This has always been a technical course and a technician's course, but I think with these larger, rounder turns, even more so now. You've got to be on that edge, get the line set up perfectly, but not let the edges grind you down too much. None of that is happening. It has oh, been a tight race, and nice. Interhop with a huge advantage now has to watch out for this compression just before the red tail. I think mentally he's been stronger, more confident than he has been the last couple of years. You can see that in his ski and tucked right through there. This time around, skiing like he is unconscious. Interhofer oh, into the lead by nearly a second. Wow, and that was some kind of run. You know, he built up his speed at the finish, but he also built up his confidence. The reason for it, because he nailed these turns after the talent. Watch the way he lengthens his body as he goes over this roller, keeps his ski, skis glued to the ground, and a perfectly carved turn right there. Boy, that was building speed through some pretty tough turns up here. And Steve, just as a comparison, remember Streitberger was really hanging out at that right-hand gate and he didn't get back very well. Well, Innerhofer got right through the middle there. He really carried his speed there. And I think this was a real executed, smart run he just made. Absolutely error-free from Innerhofer, our leader right now. More to come from the Audi, Birds of Prey. The Audi, Birds of Prey, is brought to you by Audi, Truth in Engineering, by GoPro, the world's most versatile camera, Be Hero, GoPro, by Putnam Investments, celebrating 75 years in pursuit of performance excellence, and by Sprint. The leader right now, Christoph Innerhofer, now comes Norway's Sjetil Jansrud. And this is a man who Ted Liberty looks to for inspiration in the speed events. Yonser, more of a giant slalom skier, broke out last year in his home country, winning a Super G, second place in a downhill, and Ted Liggety says that man somehow learned how to glide. They are the same equipment, and so Ted Liggety now thinking, 
it'd be my turn. Well, the, you know, that inspired Ted to do a lot more experimenting himself with his boots, with his pants, with his, his ski setup, because you've got to be close, you've got to be right in there. Look, the youngster looking fast off the flats. I mean, once he gets into the turns down here, this is his wheelhouse right in here. Big surprise to see Jans would come off the top, one tenth in front of Interhofer. Sweet turn right there. See the way he laid on that right ski? Timing was perfect. Cut right in there. I mean, the timing has got to be perfect on, on these turns here if you're going to maintain speed. And he is really rolling on a clean end. Really, this year, unlike maybe last year, we're going to go into a spectacular ski. There is an element of precision that cannot be missed on this hill this today. But I think that's partly because of the snow. The snow is so acceptable to an edge. I mean, it's not like you're bouncing around on pond ice. You're, pond ice, you're skiing on something that you really can't accomplish with turns on. Street Jow, Yonji, the more circuitous route, reflecting the time there, a half second off in the Golden Eagle. He just doesn't seem to have the pace in I think it's a sense of line. I mean, you know, he may be starting to pull himself back from a possible victory here, but this is still a darn good downhill run. Getting to the backseat right in here. Watch out for this progression in here. Plowing through the wild. Hasn't lost any of the aggression. Down turn across the line. And enough for second place. It's still a half second off. The Italian in very respectable run for Jansford, and to me, it started up in the pump house turn, just in this uh, setup to it. He stayed tight to the gates above the little roughness. We noticed that in an inspection this morning, and he really rode a clean ski. I think this is going to be critical to being fast. He even got back in a tuck in there. Remember, he's only been in the top ten in a downhill twice before. This could be one of his best runs. No, Todd, absolutely showing incredible composure, be tucking through Lucy's ride. And now Dominique Paris from Italy. Up until recently, was the lead guitarist and singer for a heavy metal band, maybe one of the heaviest <laughs> metal bands. The man, 104 kilos, 230 pounds, and just six feet tall. This guy is compact. Well, he's got gravity on his side, and that is for sure, and, and he's going to use that to his advantage. I mean, this is probably the fastest man on the flats uh, in this entire competition. We'll check out his first section time. It's going to be important for him. And Perry just in front. Now it's a matter of moving that mass from one side of this hill to another. Well, I guess the knock against him is the fact that he's really got only one radius that he skis. I mean, he hangs onto the edge a long time. He's powerful, obviously, but he's got to make uh, things happen through these turns here. He's got to be on his timing. Not known for being the most fleet of foot, but made pretty good work of those turns. Well, he's powerful, not supple. He's grinding a little bit on the edge. That's why I think he lost a little bit of speed there, six tenths of a second behind. I'm wondering, given his size, he's not known for being a good turner to be that close. Maybe it's an impressive run for him. We can hear him grunting down here. I mean, there's so many G's on these turns because you've got to hang on to the edge. You've got so much speed, and then you're coming around so much in the radius of these turns. Nice little jump there off the Golden Eagle. Right, taking care of all the details, getting a little time back now. Well, he's calculating all along how many mistakes he made, how tight he has to go down here on the bottom, let it roll to the finish. A little bit of a pre-jump there, trying to milk everything out of this run. Perry across the line, getting a few more hundreds and into third. So with that, the Italians in first and third. In second place, the Norwegian Shetto Janzerud. And an offer enjoying right now a nice lead. Will it hold up? There in the trees, one of the American coaches trying to get a better view of this track. That report. Here she is. Well, thanks for joining us down here at the finish. I suppose you'd prefer to be up at the start getting ready to race, but... You've won here three times on this course, and none more impressively, Bodie, than last year when everybody says it's really one of, one of the greatest runs ever put down on the Beaver Creek course, and the course, of course, considered one of the most difficult on the circuit. Can you take us through that run last year, what you were thinking? Yeah, I mean, you know, this is one of those courses where you got to manage your risk. You know, a lot of guys take too much risk on the top part, the C part after Talon turn. Um, 
and, and then you know, they end up making a mistake. For me, because I end up losing a little bit of time on the bottom to the real true gliders, I have to take risk up there. So this whole section down the main part of the face um, and just above coaches is just over the train. You can see the light was really tough last year and the snow was fast. So you know, I, I almost lost my you know my ski and line uh, three or four times in that tough section. But as I as you can see, I, I ended up pulling a lot of time on the on the field there, and that's what ended up. I mean, you know, the race at the bottom was was down to four hundredths of a second. So my strengths are are needed on this hill on the top. Um, to pull off, you know, a win. And, and I knew the guys were going to be pushing. I knew the guys were going to be pulling time on me on the bottom down here. Even though I skied error-free, I made no errors. It just, you know, the way my setup is and the way my balance is, they just can pull a little bit of time on me down here. And, you know, you saw it happen, but it was one of those runs where when I got to the finish, you can see I came across the line. I was psyched right there before I even knew, you know, whether I'd won or not. I, you know, when I ski that way and take that kind of risk, I'm just celebrating when I get to the finish. Right, well... <laughs> How hard is it then to stand at the bottom and, and tell us a little bit about how your rehab is going and the fact that, you know, you may not get back on the circuit this year at all? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, standing at the finish when you put a run like that down is great because you just are psyched to watch guys try to do what you did. And even though it doesn't match up exactly, I knew no one was going to take the risk I took down the pitch. No one, no, it doesn't make sense for anybody else to. That's where my strengths are, and I, I know this hill better than anybody. But I knew guys were going to be pulling time on me on the bottom. So it is kind of just fun and exciting. I, I feel like I've done my best, and I was happy to, to sit there and watch and see if guys were going to beat me. But, um, you know, it is tough. This year, I, you know, because of the stress of this course, and I know what it takes to win here, it's almost kind of nice to have a year off. This is the first year I will have been watching since I ran World Championships here in 1999. And I crashed off the last jump and came across the finish line on one ski. Um, so, you know, I've, I've raced here a lot of times. It, it'll be fun to watch and really cheer the guys on with a, with a whole heart. So, you know, if I can race this year, I will. But otherwise, I'm going to come back next year and be ready to win. I, you know, for me at this point in my career, it's really important that I'm ready to race 100% and pain-free. So that's what we're shooting for. Okay, thanks, Bodie, and good Absolutely. luck with it. Thank you. I always enjoy hearing from Bodie, and uh, I enjoyed seeing his mustache, too. Glad to see his support for prostate cancer research. And another man who knows a little something about coming back from Pan Axel Loon Spindle, the favorite of the day. We come back. Your leader right now from Italy, Christoph Innerhoff for the Italians, haven't won here since 1997. That was Christian Candina. Now comes Canadian Eric Gay. And has to be ranked among the few healthy Canadians, even though he had a knee surgery uh, just to clean up the knee in September. But he has been healthy. He was strong in Lake Louise. But at this point, Todd, do you think that this run is a little bit more difficult than what they saw in training? I think there's probably a lot of talk of the uh, team radios. Yeah, there's a little, all it takes is a couple edge marks, a couple little chatter marks to throw you off your line when the snow is, is this fast. So yes, I think uh, it's surprising a few people, especially in the setup to that uh, pump out turn. Okay, known for his gliding up 2200s over Interhofer. Talent turn here, and as they exit it, completely blind. Yeah, a real upsweep right in there. The timing's so critical right in here. You know, I've never seen Eric Gay in such a good mood. He's happy because his back doesn't hurt, because his knee doesn't hurt. You mentioned a scopey head in September, but that's behind him now. His training schedule is on is on schedule now. Oh, and went a little off the line there. Gay struggling to get back, and seven wow. tenths gone. Yeah, going low. See, they're, they're hitting a roughness right before the pump house that's sending them off their line, and then obviously he was standing up a little bit more, a little tentative, wanted to make sure he made the gate. We saw right there with the speed, almost 10 kilometers off what we saw as the fastest. That's going to hurt. Well, you bet coming off, a, you know, really, he's been a slow starter for so many years. Last year he came 45th at Lake Louise. This year he was 6th, so things were looking up. But this is not a very good run for the leader of the Canadians. Well, you said it. His best result here in the downhill. He's been on the podium once, but most of the time he got mired in the teens. It looks like Eric Gay is going to end up there once again across the line. Tenth place. And here he is, the Viking from hospital to hero in 2007. Injured on this track, came back a year later to win it. 
Got some thermal wind building up at the start. You see those flags flapping, and if you're a racer and you feel that wind, you're just hoping that it's going to be a tailwind for you across this first 24-second flat. We heard about it in training, coming from every which direction. Right now, though, it looks calm after he's gotten in between the trees. You know what I think of Spindle on this course? You know, he's been fast here many times before, but he's never been a highlight reel. He's never been as, as outgoing on this run as, say, someone like Bodie Miller when he won last year. Maybe a little bit of a tailwind there has the advantage. Well, he just he just kills these turns right across the towel, but a little bit late there. See, wow, right on his tail. Had to pull out some strength there, and often in the soft snow here after a perfect training run yesterday, this is unusual to see him offline here today. And no, Spindle does it through perfection. You don't see him making enormous recoveries and into trouble, but still with the lead. Well, he just knows how to keep letting it roll. I think if he's going to try and build up some speed, he's going to have to nail this section through here and really carry it. Speed just a little bit off. 112 kilometers we've seen up to 117. I mean, this is a guy that's constantly monitoring his speed, constantly calculating his mistakes. And if he knows he's made one, he starts attacking the line, starts cutting it off, shortening the line he takes. Well, he's going to need a little pitch to get that time back. A half second to find and a little bit more now. Yeah, but he's got the bullet going down here in a nice tight line there. I mean, he's made up time on the bottom of this hill before. And using his power, indeed, a very tight line off the red tail. A half second to find. Spindle, not enough. Cuts his deficit in half, but the Italian still with the lead. Yeah, interesting, though, that Spindle made up three-tenths of a second on the bottom, but I am really surprised after a perfect training run yesterday that he was so late in this first left-hand turn, back in the tails of his skis, and watch him across this side hill here, way down low, way in the soft snow. He is really pushing it here, and, I, and to me, that is very, very unusual. He didn't get his line back, didn't really start skiing solid until down in the bottom here, and I think he had calculated what he needed to do. He really picked it up gaining three-tenths in the lower part of the course. Now, like I said, Steve, I mean, he's not spectacular, but he's still in second place. You know, and without one of his better runs to be just two-tenths off, but Christoph Interoffer has held off the Viking. And right now, it, it was celebration before, but now it seems to be an element of disbelief. Might this just happen? Well, coming up next with the latest talent from Tahoe, California, Travis Ganong, the fastest man in the second training run. But this is race day. By ski resort standards, Beaver Creek might be the new kid in the Rockies, but in its 30 years of operation, it has become the standard of excellence in skiing worldwide. Topping out over 11,000 feet, winter comes early and stays late here. Even without Mother Nature's cooperation, the resort snowmaking will lay down a white carpet of snow that's simply unrivaled anywhere. If you prefer to watch, rather go snow globe, will shake up the world of winter sports in Diane. Now the Austrians with their final major chance at a win today, Klaus Kohl. He is the overall downhill title winner from last year, winning it at the last moment when the season closed in his town of Schladming, where the World Championships will be held this year. And that was an emotional time for this man, but comes into this season a little bit hobbled. Yeah, you know, and I'm surprised he's skiing this well. He has a broken bone in the top of his foot. He's actually using a stiffer pair of boots so the boot doesn't collapse on the top of his boot, foot and cause pain. He's skied pretty well with that stiff boot. Wow. Look at him go. And that's the thing to me that's surprising. Normally you need a softer boot for downhill so you have the feel for the flats. He is skiing spectacular, and that's a great jump that he's got to start on this course. That injury back in April, and it was a motorcycle accident. Many will recall the great Hermann Meyer almost ending his career due to a motorcycle accident. Nice timing. Look at the power and the strength. Good clean line right there. And so almost 7,500s lost for Krell, but this big man is in the past made up time from here on down. Yeah, you know what I think, if you're fast at the top, you're going to be fast down here at the bottom. So he stood up, he was a little tentative, maybe in the turns. We'll see if he can pick up that pace. Uh, now a full set to so going the wrong way, and Krell has complained, not complained, but he said the injuries kept him off snow, so some of the touch a little bit lost. Absolutely, he still can't run. 
you know, he gets in a running shoe, he can't take part in the training the way he'd like to, so his conditioning may be a little bit off. I could be part of this problem here today. So Krell in the final stretch, getting a little time back, but Innerhofer just devastating the field in the upper part of the course, and Krull in to eighth place. Top seven ranked skiers have gone, but do not forget this American, Travis Ganon, in the second training run, had the fastest time, which at this point, Todd, is still the fastest ride down this mountain. But to hold it together on race day for this guy, who has never had a fast training run, what do you think he's going to do? <laughs> well, I hope I hope what he does is just blow things right out of here. I mean, Andy Evers, his new downhill speed coach, is going to say, listen, you got this thing nailed. What you got to do is get your head down on the flax because you got to pick up some time in this top part. Even with the fastest time in training, the second run, he was still 38 hundredths of a second behind right up here. He's got to clean that up and then ski the way he did. Here it is. He is close off the Close about the same. The man has a chance to get on the podium. Ganon will have to be clean here, and that has been a very tall order. Stand up tall, get on the right line, hit the timing down here. This is the, those are the key words that are in his mind. A little bit of a chop right in there. Maybe a little bit more tension in those legs today. It's not quite as soft, not quite as loose as it was in training. There has been trouble for it earlier this year. He's going to turn to going into the loose side. Well, there's a lot of pressure, you know, when he had a good run, you're trying to prove on that run when really sometimes all you need to do is ski it exactly the same way. Don't look for a different line, just to maintain. Therein lies the question, can you do it just like you did in training? Because it seems to be a different course. Well, you got to take the information you get. That's the, I mean, the guys that go down ahead of you listen to the other team. Right? He's, he's back in his tails there. Big jump, a dangerous one for Gino. Ganon finding a little bit of speed, not the ones he had in training. It's never been in the points inside the top 30 in this race. Looks like he'll keep up with the match, but the podium a long ways away for Ganon, who checks into 14th. You know, Steve, that probably wasn't the run he was looking for, but you know, looking back at it, it really wasn't a bad performance either. I think the one thing that caught him by surprise was the roughness in the pump house setup. In this turn right in here, watch his outside ski, his left ski. He starts losing it right in here, bouncing on the inside one, really comes back on his tails, and then he whacks his gate. I mean, he barely stayed in the course at this point. I mean, so that was a big mistake. He'd like to have that one over, and down in the Golden Eagle jump, just a little bit twisted in the air. I mean, that wasn't perfect form either, but I mean, still, this is probably, if he stays within the top 20, only going to be his fourth time in World Cup competition at downhill into the top 20. So I think it was still a pretty good performance. An interesting point to make, even with those mistakes, made a little time on Interhofer in the final stretch of the track. Well, the Americans aren't done yet. Marco Sullivan enjoying something of a renaissance as he comes off a third place just last week and American Ted Lady, the great giant slalom skier, trying to do it in the downhill. This network continues on December 22nd on NBC. And guess who is up next? Where Marco Sullivan races, the Marco Fan Club follows. Marco Sullivan, a 32-year-old from Tahoe, has had a long road to get back to the top. In 2004, a devastating injury took him out for two years, found himself pulling a file in a ski shop, and then most recently suffered from back injuries that forced him to actually pay his way back to the U.S. ski team. Listen, this guy's got the experience. All he needed, I think, was a little pat in the back, some confidence, and get him going again. I mean, that third place is going to do wonders for his, uh, for where his head is. That 900th of a second off the pace, that's going to help him too. It has been a rapidly ride, Todd, on this pitch here. What does Sullivan need to do to stay in it? Well, the, the thing that happens is you see the tracks of the other skiers ahead of you, and sometimes you try and dive in inside of them, get inside the roughness, and that takes your timing off. You've got to be smart. You've got to be able to ski the line that you intended and not change it on the way down. Sullivan told me if he can be just fairly close at this interval at the bottom part of the track where he shines. 
Hey, Tance, he's got some work to do on the bottom, but that's not really that bad. He's going to be in the top ten with that time if he can just hang on to it. Now, if he doesn't let any more time bleed, that could put him inside the top four. Oh, it's oh there. back in the tails. That's another buff. Boy, you come out of the sun into the shade like that, it is dark in there. He just hit something, and that really cost him a lot, didn't it? About eight-tenths of a second in that one mistake. Right on the flats, the engine for what you need to take you into Golden Eagle. A great glider and flyer is Sullivan. Always good in the air. He loves that a little tighter line down here at the bottom. He's really going to try and push it. He knows that mistake might have cost him. Sullivan's best result here. Long time ago, sixth place. If he charges now, he could get maybe inside of the top 10. The American Sullivan to the line and into 17th. So the Americans, 15th and 17th. Maybe not exactly what Sullivan wanted, but better than anything he produced last year. So on the right trajectory. Now, in the gate, the best American giant slalom skier in history, Ted Ligeti, the world champion three times. He has won the giant slalom title. The man knows how to go right and left, Todd, but can he go straight? <laughs> That's right, yeah, he's going to have to shift you know, you think back a month ago, he started off his season in the most amazing way at Solon. He won the opening giant slalom on the glacier. His margin of victory, 2.75 seconds. I repeat, 2.75 <laughs> seconds. That is incredible. I mean, that margin of victory hasn't been seen since the early 80s, and everybody was buzzing about it. That is why they call him Mr. GS, now trying to become a Mr. Downhill. But in all the disciplines, he wants to be an all-rounder. He has been close to the podium in downhill and in Super G. And it's not an easy concept because, I mean, for a guy like Ted, he's got to change boots, he's got to change uh, his ski setup. It's very difficult to go from the turns of GS into these turns of downhill, longer radius. Oh, laying over that ski just like a giant slalom, but a little bit of a wild ride. Oh, baby, six tenths of a second. He is right in the thick of things here. And so Ted Ligeti proving he can hang with some of the best downhillers in the world. The speed, quite good. Now the thing will be, does he hang on the edges a little bit too long? Sometimes you can dig him in a little bit too much, and he's lost a lot of time, Steve, 1.3 seconds. Right in the screech owl, Todd, where you said it was so difficult, now into the air, very comfortable there, back on the deck. You know, when I talked to, to uh, Ted yesterday, he said, I want to get in the top 15 and downhill. I'm going to be disappointed if I'm not there. I think he's going to be disappointed looking at the tape here. He could have made up some time in the middle. Well, look at him strong on top of the wild ride by the time he gets to the bottom to 26, 1.92 off, so not up to his own standard. But up top, what incredible angles he had. Another look at it with the Putnam performance in motion. I've always talked about the big edge angles that Ted Leggetty develops, but it's the result of those angles that's truly amazing. Typical turn for him, 75 degree edge angle. That equals 3.9 Gs. That's more force than an astronaut would experience during a typical space shuttle launch. Now, consider the number of turns on this course, you're talking about a pretty big workout. Gee, Todd, that's heavy stuff. Right now, Hinterhofer looking pretty comfortable there in the lead flank by the Norwegian, Spindal and Jansru. When we come back, one more American, Steve Nyman. For Pacific only on NBC. 27 year old Florian Scheiber of Austria, a man who in 2005 was a silver medalist in the Giant Slum in the World Junior Championships, but got his World Cup debut, Todd, in 2009. It took him that long to earn a spot on the World Cup team of Austria. You're right, not exactly a rookie, but the problem on the Austrian team. Even if you're an up-and-coming racer, you may only get one shot and you're expected to produce results. And, uh, you know, it's a tough road there. He finally got his best career result last week in Lake Louise, Canada, 11th place in the downhill. And also one of the Austrians who take all three of his training runs and great sunlight he is enjoying on the top there. Yeah, Scheiber doesn't have a lot of experience on this course. I mean, in his position, I'd sure take as many runs on here as you could you could get. Staying within the tracks. I mean, this is pretty good skiing up here in the top. I mean, so many of the skiers have been rattled in the early part of this track, and Scheiber holding tough there, just 2,300 back. How did he do that? He stayed inside the tracks right there, and he stayed high. He stayed above those uh, chatter marks. 
that was pretty good skiing. You figure he got a good course report from the coaches? Absolutely, got some experience. Uh, Shouted back up to him at the start. Well, speed on the flats, and it is showing within a half second. You know, the thing I'm so surprised about today is that so many people have lost time in that midsection right after Screech Owl. Shiver is keeping his pace up only half a second behind. John oh, Florian Shiver coming out of Bib 42, having a miraculous run. Yeah, this is not the kind of course that the late start numbers have any kind of advantage. This is good skiing. And so Shiver looking there at the time of Interhofer, not enough, but good enough for fourth place. And there's the result of a career. Nature Valley, a proud sponsor of the USSA, is passionate about enjoying nature and preserving America's national parks. Let's hear from U.S. ski team athlete Stephen Nyan about why he likes visiting the national parks. The outdoors, I believe, taught me everything. I grew up in Sundance, Utah, surrounded by national forests. Uh, grew up doing outdoor activities, mountain biking, hiking, camping, skiing, and it has its own way of guiding you through the lessons of life. This spring, this U.S. team, we went down to Zion National Park and we did a road biking camp. And we rode 70 miles for four days in a row. It was beautiful, just surrounded by the Red Rock cathedrals underneath these canyons, and it was just amazing. Uh, Utah, I'm fortunate enough to live there. It has so many national parks, and I've hit them all up, and that's kind of been a part of my life ever since I was young. Without our national parks, I think we'd be lost. I, I, I know I would. There's a connection between human and nature, and that connection keeps growing further and further apart, and I think the national parks continue to uh, keep us together. To learn more about Nature Valley's efforts to preserve our national parks, visit preservetheparks.com. And now here he is. Interesting to see him on the bike there. I've heard tales that he is a beast on the bike. The numbers he puts out, similar to that of a lower level pro. Of course, he stands six foot four, 215 pounds. One thing to remember though, Todd, he is coming back from an Achilles injury last year and just a few weeks ago took a hard crash in training. That's right, Steve. You know, it's been a long time since he found success. Back in 2006, he laid down a third place result here. Backed that up with his first victory in Val Gardena, Italy, a couple weeks after that. But, you know, it has been an easy ride since then. He's looking for something to start developing here. So now into the talent turn, the forces will start to develop. We saw it on Ligeti, and that's going to be hard on the Achilles. I talked to him after the training yesterday, he said, you know, I'm satisfied with the way I'm skiing. I think I'm hitting the line pretty good here. I'm improving bit by bit. He said, I'm a very patient man and I can wait. But the problem in this run so far, it looks like he's waiting for the course to come at him. He's not pushing it, more than a second behind. Nyman, before the injury, had a great history on this hill, has been second and third, but I think you're right, just a, a little timid this time around and a little more trouble. Yeah, a little bit sloppy coming into the Screech Owl turn. I mean, that, that's a tough one. We talked about G-forces, and if you don't ride a clean ski, all those Gs are lost in scrubbing off speed. 1.78 back. If he can hold it at that, can get inside the points. Well, on the ragged edge down here on the bottom. I mean, this is a guy that's got a lot of people sympathizing for him. A lot of, his, a lot of fans want to see him move up. May not happen in this run, but maybe later this season. And Nyman off the final jump. Will he get there in time and just outside the points? Steve Nyman, 45th to 32nd, doesn't like that one. He'll think on it. And Todd, there is the support you were talking about. So the surprise of the day, Christoph Innerhofer picking up his first victory in over four years. And the Norwegian Spindal and Jansrud once again joining each other on a speed podium. The American solid there, 16th and 18th for Ganong and Sullivan. And now we go down to our Kristen Cooper, who's with our winner. I was watching with Modi Miller down here at the bottom, and he watched her run, and he said that was very clean and very well done. Yeah, it was. I, the feeling before I had start, it was like on the World Championships where I had win. So I, it was for me like a training run, you know. I was. I'd say, hey, Christoph, take it easy, and then in the steep one, you push, but not too much. Not too much, because you must push and enjoy and skin smooth. Hey, it was perfect run, and 
Crazy, crazy, I cannot believe it. <laughs> okay, well, congratulations, thank great win. Thank you, thank you for Okie dokie. Okie dokie, bye bye. <laughs> See you. Uh, Okie okay, dokie, okay. when we come back, we will wrap things up. There's your winner, Christoph Interhofer. He'll think on it. And Todd, there is the support you were talking about. So the surprise of the day, Christoph Innerhofer picking up his first victory in over four years. And the Norwegian, Spindal and Jansrud once again joining each other on a speed podium. The American solid there, 16th and 18th for Ganong and Sullivan. And now we go down to our Kristen Cooper, who's with our winner. I was watching with Modi Miller down here at the bottom, and he watched her run, and he said that was very clean and very well done. Yeah, it was... I the feeling before I had start, it was like on the World Championships where I had win. So I, it was for me like a training one, you know. I was, I'd say, hey, Christoph, take it easy, and then in the steep one, you push, but not too much. Not too much because you must push and enjoy and skin smooth. Hey, it was perfect run and crazy, crazy. I cannot believe it. <laughs> okay. Well, congratulations, thank great win. Thank you, thank you for. Okie dokie. Okie dokie. Bye bye. <laughs> See you. Uh, okay, okay, when we come back, we will wrap things up. There's your winner, Christoph Interhofer. And now look at the Audi World Cup overall standings at Norway Spindal with today's second. Moving well into the lead, Ted Ligadine still living off this giant slalom there in second. And now our Christian Cooper with the top American, Travis Ganon. Travis, everybody's talking about how much tougher it is today than it was in training, and you trained so well. What happened to you up there? Um, yeah, I mean, race day, I wanted to win today. I wanted to just see what happened by just sending it going as fast as I could, and I got a little bumped around. There's one section that got a little bumpier today, and I just got tossed through that, so that was my race. But I still had a really solid run, and I'm, I have a lot of speed right now, so I'm pretty happy with where I finished. It's a good, my, my third top 15 result, so I'm pretty happy. So hopefully next year I can come here and win it. Okay, well, congratulations and good luck with that. Yeah, thanks. A reminder, coming up next on NBC Sports, the AT&T Winter National Swimming Championships. And over on the NBC Sports Network, you can watch our live coverage of the Giants Slalom featuring Olympic gold medalist Ted Ligeti. For Todd Brooker and Kristen Cooper, I'm Steve Ramos and so long from Beaver Creek, Colorado.